What is going on everyone? Wally back at you with another Q&A. And this one's focused mainly on Delore. So if you want your question featured, uh, make sure you comment down below. Hit me up on Twitter or just be in the Discord server. Real quickly though, before we hop in, I want to apologize for not getting content out on a consistent basis thus far. A lot of things that are going on right now in my life and it's pulling me in a million different ways. More on that in the end of the video. But I always want to be continuing to upload YouTube videos regardless of where I'm at in life. So if you want more information, ask me directly in the comment section or on Discord. With that being said, let's hop right into the Q&A. The first question coming in from Dafur, he's saying, how do exos have their own will and how does their memory get erased or reformatted? So he asks a really good question and some of this is sort of answered in Cade's Treasure Island book and some of it can be pulled from the general game world and lower grimoire cards. Exos should be treated like a human consciousness in a platform. Uh, essentially, if you were to take your mind, personality, and all of your quirks and put it on a walking metallic supercomputer. I'm fairly confident Exos, one, have their own free will, and two, have the ability to remember some of the hard resets, and three, can be in a way reformatted or made better. As far as the process goes, it's assumed that Exos went through their memory wipes before the collapse, and it was probably at a location funded and ran by Clovis Bright. Remember that Exos were designed for two goals, indefinitely extend human life and have a superhuman soldier without the drawbacks of blood, bone, and flesh. So I look at Exos of today as humans or fragments of humans in metallic bodies, but without the ability, or at least now, for a new memory wipe. The next question coming in from Jay, the Radish Lord. He asks, are Exos a lost technology? And is there any reference that we can create more? Need me some of that deep stone crypt. And this is a follow-up Exo question. And I do love this one. So for a little backstory, the deep stone crypt and Cage Treasure Island story share a lot of potential similarities. Essentially, a golden age megatech corp called Clovis Bray dabbled quite a bit in the experimentation of human psyche transfer. Now, this technology isn't super far-fetched. The human brain, in a very generalized way, is sort of like an organic computer. It operates on electronic charges through neurons to create thoughts, movement, and other bodily functions. But as we all know, the human body is supremely limited. Cold, heat, disease, general weakness, etc. So Clovis wanted to create a path for both humans to one, live forever, and both be incredibly powerful in their own right. While I don't think we can create more XOs, at least not since the Golden Age collapsed, I do think Destiny 2 will provide a very clear outline of XOs, their history, and what exactly they are truly. Are they actually humans? Or are they copies of humans? Questions I'd like to see answered. To continue on this, if you've played a game called Soma, it's sort of a survival horror exploration game, there is a concept in that game where the human psyche gets copied again and again and again, and any time you wanted to transfer, let's say, your original self to another metallic platform, you couldn't take your own original psyche or personality. It was literally a copy of yourself. So when you go to transfer, the original version of yourself dies and a copy lives on. Now, I really hope this isn't the case for Exos because that is terrifying and very, very scary to know if you are just a copy of something else. You're not the real version. Everyone wants to be the real version of themselves. So maybe it's explained more and I really, really hope it is explained more in Destiny 2. This one's coming from Cerebral Paladin, a Patreon supporter. He asked, do you think we will see Xur and the Nine explained in Destiny 2? Do you think he will come through on the farm? So, not even from a lore point, just from a gameplay familiarity and loot delivery point, I have a pretty solid idea that we're going to see Xur in D2 again. However, the second part regarding the Nine is more up in the air. The Nine have always been mentioned, but never explained, and it's frustrated a lot of players who went through the original story in Destiny 1 and went through covering some of the lore in the expansions. While the Nine were occasionally mentioned, especially in points from, say, the House of Wolves storyline and then Skolish's capture and Marazov, 
The Nine do have the closest relationship with two well-known characters. The obvious first one, Xur, and the more difficult to explain but well-known second one, the Awoken Queen, Marazov. But there lies the problem. The Marzov story and that of the Reef, the storyline with the closest potential ties to the Nine, has been dropped or at least halted in Destiny 2, according to Luke Smith, in order to better deliver a more digestible story in D2. So while I don't think the Nine are particularly done per se, I just don't think they're going to be immediately brought up until maybe a few expansions down the line. The next question comes from Andraste Blaze. He asks, how likely is it from a lore perspective that Saint-14 is with Osiris? And this one is honestly really, really tough to say. Now, personally, I'd like to say that Saint-14 is with Osiris as they've had some interaction during and after the Battle of Six Fronts and before the Battle of Twilight Gap. But there are a few lore points that directly contradict this point. One, his helmet is a lootable object. In a way, it sort of implies that he no longer uses it, and it could suggest his death. Secondly, the tower held a quote-unquote legendary vigil for him, which suggests again that he is dead. Although, to be very clear, it's never clearly stated that Saint-14 is dead, stop looking for him. To continue on this point, I'd seriously love to see Saint-14 in the lore story. We don't have too many XOs for the community to attach themselves to. Barring Cade and, in my opinion, the FWC vendor Lakshmi doesn't really count. I'm also a huge fanboy for XOs, and I have a feeling all my characters in D2 are going to be XOs. I hope that doesn't inspire any hate. Alex asks, do you think they will explain the subclass changes in the lore for D2? How so? And how would I choose to explain it if I could? So, I really hope they do explain it. It's a great chance to flesh out the world and give characters and players the choice to fully invest themselves into the character if they understand how that character has their powers. I assume a quick summary could be explained during the story missions, especially when Guardians recover their light. It could be explained as sort of a quote, harness the lightning from this electronic storm or electric storm and rediscover the Arc Striker Titan, unquote, type thing. But to answer the question more fully, I explain it sort of like this. During the story of the Taken King, players got access to the third subclass, and it was done through providing players with a lore-ish mission that would help you explain how you unlock this newly formed power. I'd use those type of missions to inspire a newer, more in-depth approach. Ideally, you find a mentor of that subclass, and he or she teaches you to wield the light in a new way. This whole approach would be designed to pull the player and their character closer and make their investment incredibly meaningful. So Planet Kirohito asks, can you make a video explaining how, by the sword logic, if you kill someone, you become more powerful? So this is a really good question. While I don't think I'd develop a full video on this topic, simply because I think a lot of the old lore in Destiny 1, especially the Books of Sorrow, doesn't need my explanation when we have so much other talent covering it. The way it is described, though, in the Books of Sorrow was that the Hive, whenever they killed a non-Hive, the essence of the dead was absorbed by the warm larvae that lived inside them. But I honestly see the sword logic as more metaphorical than a transference of souls or mystical essence. The sword logic is a cosmic form of survival of the fittest, and the Hive continually strive to challenge themselves through warfare. So when you pit yourself up against any opponent, especially one that is equal or stronger to you, and you achieve victory, you are literally stronger now than you were before that conflict. This is how I envision the sword logic. Constant warfare, constant struggle, constantly pushing yourself against the blade edge of survival to achieve dominance. Protheon asks, who is your favorite personal character in the Destiny universe and why? So it's tied, really, but it's either between Tolan the Shattered or Kabir or Kabar or however you choose to pronounce it. Big fans of both, but I think I'll have to side with Toland on this one, mainly due to his insanity or semi-insanity and how often he is referenced in the lore. You are talking about an individual who was exiled for his heretical thinking and experimentation on the darkness 
and the Hive, a lore character that, in my opinion, rivals Osiris. That and the bad juju is such a dope weapon. My go-to in many different situations in PvP and PvE in Destiny 1. I really hope we get more information about Toland. But I'm pretty sure Kabar's story is dead and done. But never say never, as Justin Bieber would say. Final question, and it's sort of a follow-up to the last question we just have, comes from Jay, the Radish Lord, once again. He asks, the most misunderstood character in Destiny, in your opinion? This one's really tough. I went back and forth a few times, but I honestly feel it's Oryx, and only because of how the Books of Sorrow depict him or her or whatever. We were talking about a character that was betrayed by someone he trusted, forced to make a choice that doomed his people to constant struggle so that they could survive. And essentially, he and his people were a test by the Traveler and the Leviathan to see if beings could resist the darkness. His story is honestly the most unique description of a tragedy we've seen so far in the Destiny storyline. And I think killing him off so early in Destiny's life cycle sort of sucks. I really hope Gaul can live up to Oryx in terms of lore, story, and motivations, but honestly, I'm not super confident. But I'd like to turn that question to you guys, though, in the comments section. Who is your most misunderstood character in the Destiny lore? That's going to do it for this episode, guys. In the next one I'm going to do, I'm going to pull from both the first episode and this episode's comment section. I failed to do that this time, and I apologize for that. I've honestly been really pressed for time recently. I've been going through multiple job interviews, and the drone company is taking off. And unfortunately, the channel sort of has fallen behind. I'm still here, though and I'm gonna keep uploading on a consistent or as consistent as possible schedule. But if you guys want real-time updates, follow me on Twitter or hop into the Discord. I cannot wait to grab some games with you guys come Destiny 2. Love you guys, and I really appreciate the continued support. Peace.